Anderson Cooper, AC360, CNN Weeknights, 10 Eastern. I heard people working with the U.N. say to me, look, there is a lack of leadership on the ground on the part of the Haitian government. There is a lack of coordination among NGOs. Uh, there is- well, I agree with that. But keep in mind, I have it's not for lack of effort. We have met with uh, the groups in the United States representing over 90 percent of the funds spent by NGOs here. They all promise to work with us through the commission to coordinate their activities, to put them on the Internet, to describe how much money they put into Haiti and where it was being spent. Because unless they're coordinated and working with you, exactly. it makes no sense. A lot of NGOs are also running into problems when they're bringing in emergency supplies, building supplies. They're getting hit at customs with taxes or huge storage fees. We brought in, uh, for uh, for one organization, $5,000 worth of, of equipment for building. And it wasn't pre-approved, so we they got, made them pay We fees. got hit up for $1,000 in fees, 20% of the cost. And a lot of NGOs yeah. say that happens, and the government gets that storage fee money. Yes, I am, uh, as we get the donor money in here, I believe I will succeed in getting the government to drop that fee. The government does not apply to NGOs that are pre-registered and already working here. Mm. But when NGOs come in for the first time and they're not pre-registered and they don't know anything about them, they do. But even NGOs that are working here, I mean, the ones that... I've tried to get them to change this whole custom system. They should fast-track emergency supplies, right? They should, and they shouldn't charge them any custom city. Zero. Uh, it's not right. Is it, I mean, is that basically just about trying to get generate money for the government? It's, it's what I call the chokehold theory of revenues. You know, what do people have to use to get into Haiti? They have to use the ports and the airports. So that's where you hit up people for money. And so that's where the money flows through. Their normal revenue base has been destroyed. But they should not apply to the NGOs. When we can get the donor money flowing in here, they won't need that money so much anymore. And I believe I'll be able to get them to abandon it. I have worked really hard to do this. It's, it's wrong. It makes them look bad. A lot of the NGOs are convinced that it's some sort of corruption scam. It really is. There is a, I've checked the rules. I've checked the law. They can do it, but I want them to leave it. And I think they will leave it as soon as we get a revenue flow. As soon as I can say, okay, look, for the next 18 months, here's how much money is coming into Haiti, how much will be given to direct budget support. Now, please let the NGOs come in here. So of the $5.3 billion that's been pledged for the next yeah, 18 I'd months, say, I'd, is- say we're, uh, I'd say we're right around maybe $200 million that's been spent one way or the other, maybe a little more. The United States has spent, Brazil's given $155 million, the United States has so that's only spent about 5% over of the money has yeah, actually shown up. Yeah, over $100 uh, million that they spent on housing and things. And that's what you're going to be focusing on the next couple of weeks, trying yes. to pressure those governments. Yes, to I'm going to call all those governments and say, it, the ones who said they'll give money to support the Haitian government, I want to try to get them to give the money. And I'm going to try to get the others to give me a schedule for when they'll release it. Probably the most visible sign, though, of, of things not moving along fast enough is the rubble. But basically, the rubble is still yes. all there. There's a huge amount of rubble. People can't move back into homes. There or, is. And, you know... The, the president let these uh, 100 trucks go today, which he got on a very good terms from the Dominican Republic, which will enable people to move their own rubble, and the cost will be about a third what it's, the UN is, UN's embedded cost was. So that's a good move. I am looking at two different models of, of technology that destroy rubble through heat and generate electricity. I've heard that there's no master plan. There's only one place right now designated to take the rubble, and that there's really no international funding for taking rubble with mach- heavy machinery, which is crucial. That's correct. That's one of the reasons this is important. But we, uh, the commission, the prime minister and I, will make a decision sometime in the next couple of weeks about how viable this on-site destruction is. Because that could solve, you know, somewhere between 20 and 80 percent of this problem rather than removing it to some distant location yeah we could if we burn it then all you got to do is bury ash ash can be fertilizer it'll be great you've had a lot of tough jobs in terms of other jobs you've done how tough is this one where does this compare but i've never dealt with a place that lost uh, essentially its urban center and 30 percent of its population and far more than that of its gdp we just got to go back and reconstruct it and on the other hand uh because of the scale if we do it right, and they do it right, I think they'll be much better off when the rebuilding is done economically and socially than they are now. So those in the United States who are watching, who see people still living in these camps, more than a million and a half people still living in these camps, and who say, well, it looks like this whole reconstruction relief effort is stalled, what do you say? I say, even in Florida, when Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992, a year later, not everybody was in a home. Uh, in New Orleans, we had hotels to put people in, but 